We will now address one of the thornier issues in contract law that we will consider this year, the so-called battle of the forms. We have previously learned that to create a contract, an offeree's acceptance must be the mirror image of the offer. If the offeree, in attempting to accept, changes any non-trivial term of the offer, he is not accepted. Instead, he has made a counteroffer. Given these basic rules of contract formation, problems arise when parties use pre-printed forms to contract, forms containing their own terms and conditions, often referred to as boilerplate. The use of such forms is common among large commercial parties. Not surprisingly, the standard terms that appear in pre-printed forms tend to favor the party sending the form. In general, commercial parties are interested in the major terms of a contract, description, price, and quantity. Given how common the use of pre-printed forms has become in today's commercial world, parties tend not to haggle over the standard terms and conditions in boilerplate. Therefore, when such forms are used for contracting, there are likely to be conflicts between the terms of the parties' respective documents. Nonetheless, in the vast majority of cases, such conflicts are irrelevant because parties undertake and complete their contractual obligations without any dispute, entirely oblivious to the fact that the documents they exchanged contain conflicting provisions. Each side performs its duties, the work is completed, payment is made, and everyone is happy. But when a dispute does occur, the question arises as to which party's terms and conditions govern the dispute. The common law principles of contracting lead to the so-called last shot rule. Given the mirror image rule, every time a document with conflicting terms is exchanged during negotiations, it will effectively be a counteroffer. At some point, one party begins performance. Given common law rules of acceptance by conduct, beginning performance is interpreted as accepting the terms of the last counteroffer exchanged. Accordingly, the terms of the last document exchanged will, generally, be deemed to govern disputes, thus the so-called last shot rule. The drafters of the Uniform Commercial Code considered this result to be unduly rigid and unfair, especially in light of the fact that the contracting parties negotiate over a contract's essential terms. They rarely haggle over and often do not even read the terms hidden in boilerplate. Accordingly, the drafters adopted Section 2-207 in an attempt to mitigate the unfairness of the mirror image and the last shot rules. Let's begin with subpart 1 of that provision, which reads, This subpart allows an offeree's acceptance to create a valid contract despite the fact that the offeree's acceptance contains terms that are not the mirror image of the offer. The first thing to notice is that this subpart applies to two different situations. First, it applies in instances where there has been a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance. Second, it applies to instances involving a written confirmation. The first clause deals with cases in which the parties exchange writings. The second clause deals with cases in which the parties have already entered into an oral agreement and one or both parties follow up with a document that purports to memorialize the terms of that agreement. Let's begin with the first clause involving a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance. This UCC section makes no mention of an offer, but it assumes that one has already been made. Whether there is an offer on the table is determined by the common law rules we've already considered. Assuming an offer has been made, if the offeree manifests timely assent to the offer, referred to as a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance, a contract will be created even though that acceptance contains additional or different terms not found in the offer. Whether these additional or different terms become part of the contract is determined by Section 2-207 Subsection 2, which we will consider in the next module. What is clear is that this section of the UCC abolishes the mirror image rule at least in some cases. There are three important instances in which a written response to an offer will not operate as an acceptance. First, if the response cannot be reasonably viewed as an expression of acceptance, it will not result in a contract. Consider the following case. The buyer sends the seller a purchase order for 100 widgets at $5 per widget. 
The seller responds in writing that it will gladly sell the buyer 100 widgets at $6 per widget. The seller's response is not a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance because it has rejected an essential term of the buyer's offer, the proposed price. Rather, it is a counteroffer. The second situation in which a definite expression of acceptance will not operate as an acceptance is where it is not seasonable. In other words, not timely. Consider the following. The buyer writes to the seller offering to purchase the seller's A1 industrial saw for $1,000 and requires acceptance of the offer by Friday. If the seller sends a written acceptance on the following Monday, the acceptance is not seasonable and therefore ineffective to form a contract. Finally, the third situation in which the offeree's definite and seasonable expression of acceptance will not operate as an acceptance of the offer is where the offeree explicitly conditions acceptance on the offeror's assent to the offeree's additional or different terms. The drafters have termed this a conditional acceptance. In effect, a conditional acceptance is no acceptance at all, but rather a counteroffer. Courts have made clear that the offeree's response to an offer will be treated as a conditional acceptance only if there is a clear and explicit language making it a conditional acceptance. An example would be language in the seller's written acceptance such as the following. The seller accepts the buyer's order on the condition that the buyer agree to indemnify the seller for any claims of injury arising out of the use of the seller's product. Including such a condition satisfies the last clause of subpart 1 of 2-207 and keeps the offeree's response from operating as an acceptance. Rather, it is a counteroffer. Let's now consider the other instance mentioned in subpart 1 of UCC section 2-207, dealing with a written confirmation. This situation arises where parties have already entered into an oral contract and one or both parties follow up with a written document that purports to memorialize the oral contract, but which actually contains additional or different terms not previously agreed to by the parties. Under such circumstances, the issue is not whether there is a contract. The issue is whether the additional or different terms in the memorialization become part of the oral contract, an issue dealt with in the next module. Notice that in such instances, because a contract has already been formed, the last unless clause of subpart 1 dealing with conditional acceptance, a counteroffer, is entirely irrelevant. Subpart 1 makes a distinction between additional terms and different terms. As a rough guideline, a term is different if it varies or contradicts something provided in the offer or written confirmation. A term is additional if it adds new matter not covered in the offer or the written confirmation. We need to consider one additional situation in which the UCC finds a contract to exist despite conflicting language in the party's writing. That covered by section 2-207 subpart 3. Take a look at the first sentence of this section. This section covers cases where the offeree's written response to the offer so varies essential terms of the offer that it cannot be considered a definite and seasonable expression of acceptance, but rather must be a counteroffer. But what happens if, nonetheless, the parties move forward and begin performing as if there were a contract? In such a case, the UCC views such conduct to establish a contract despite the fact that, based only on the conflicting writings, no contract would be found to exist. We will learn in the next module how the UCC deals with the conflicting terms in the parties' writings.